Hi, this is Des Blanchfield. We are here at Mobile World Congress 2018 in sunny old Barcelona, although not so sunny this morning. I have the privilege of having a countryman with me here, uh, Mike Wright. Mike, how are you today? Uh, not too bad at all. Great to have you. Thanks for making time to catching up with us. So Mike, you're with Telstra, you're here in Barcelona, we're on the uh, Ericsson Pavilion. Maybe could you just briefly introduce yourself and your role with Telstra and then uh, what you're doing here this week with Ericsson? Yeah, sure. So I look after all of Telstra's networks, which means we engineer all the fixed networks, all the wireless networks, all the optical networks, and then we build the products that sit on top of them, which includes enterprise products, consumer products, and even media products. Fantastic. Now your focus and your remit is predominantly networks, I understand. Anything to do with the network and connectivity for right. Telstra's customers. Fantastic. And you've got a whole range of uh, challenges there around uh, development, deployment, labs, etc. Let's maybe dive into a couple of the key topics you're here for. So I understand you've got, I mean, Australia is the sixth largest piece of dirt on the planet. We've got about 23 million people. I, I think, what, what, 80% of them are sort of moved to mobile, etc. Fairly small numbers in, in the grand scheme, but a really big physical challenge. And we've always had this challenge of a small population to be able to keep up with new and emerging technologies. But we've always been quite ahead of the curve in my knowledge. Um, the transition from 4 to 5G is a, is, is a non-trivial undertaking, I guess, to, to, to the understatement of the week. Um, you've picked Ericsson as a partner to, to undertake that challenge. Could you maybe give us some background on how that relationship came about with regard to working with Ericsson and leveraging their technology to start with? Yeah, absolutely, and there's a lot in that because the history of, of Telstra and wireless goes back a long way. And indeed, we do provide uh, coverage to, to Australians in remote areas in a somewhat unique way. And one of the reasons we come to places like Barcelona is so that we can actually meet other operators, in fact, influence standards and get technology to evolve in a way that's good for Telstra and good for Australians. So the reason we can cover such a large population, like 99.4%, uh, get 3G uh, and or 4G coverage uh, in Australia, is because we take technology and optimise it. And you know, the, the most typical example of that is nearly every generation of technology that's come along was designed without Australia in mind, and typically that meant the radio software was limited to 35 kilometres. So right. every generation we have gone and had to have the technology change. One of the beauties about 5G is we got in early, the standards have already allowed for us to break that barrier, and that's one of the foundational things. If we're going to bring coverage to Australians, it's got to match the Australian conditions. So we come back every year trying to find new technologies, work with partners like Ericsson and other partners to uh, influence the roadmap and bring great stuff back for Australians. That's a really good point you raised there because I think one of the things we're seeing from 5G, certainly with the demos here, is that it is, uh, you know, and I know Telstra's worked closely with Ericsson and, and the team inside 3GPP around getting the standard right, and that is that you've got short to medium and, and long term sort of radio capability because as you said in Australia, it's, it's a very, very big piece of dirt. There's vast areas where there's sort of big freeways that go from nowhere to nowhere. Um, whereas in Europe, we've got very, very tightly, densely populated uh, populations, certainly in cities like Barcelona. Um, tell us about the uh, transition from what you've been doing uh, in your labs previously with, with the transition from, I guess, 2 to 3G, 3 to 4G, and now the 4 to 5G. I mean, you've got some very big uh, infrastructure and sunk costs in that you've got to continue to get an ROI from. You've got this new challenging of emerging network technologies, and not just emerging new technologies, but also virtualization, right? How does that work in your labs that are going from an idea and a new concept and a standard to putting it in the lab and then productizing it and rolling it out with partners like Ericsson? Yeah, well, if, you, if we go back, for example, for the 2 to 3G evolution, we had to figure out ways to extend that technology, in some cases, out to 200 kilometers. We had to develop high power amplifiers, and that's a big, big rollout. You know, to get 2.4 million square kilometers is you know, approaching 9,000 base stations already in a network. Wow. And so as a new technology comes along, it doesn't usually instantly cover everywhere. So we need to not only invest in the new technology, but make sure we continue to evolve the old. And there's a classic example with what we're doing with 4G. We came here last year, and, uh, and we'd launched the world's first gigabit 4G modem and network capability. Now, that capability goes in the dense parts of the network to begin with, because the dense parts of Australia are just like the centre of New York or anywhere else in yeah. the world. And then what we do is we evolve that technology on demand to a bigger footprint. So this year we've come and we're demonstrating here two gigabit speeds on 4G, which is really 5G light. So what will happen is as we roll out 5G, we'll have a bigger footprint of the 4G network, so that will underpin those applications mm. for a long period of time. So that's the radio bit yeah. of what's happening with the evolution of the network. But the really interesting thing that goes with 5G evolution is not just in the radio, it's the biggest change to network architecture ever. Right. And the reason for that is twofold. Firstly, the rate of growth of data on our networks is so 
rapid that we can't build the equipment box by box, wire by wire, the way we used to do it. Okay. We, we can't get the engineers, we can't move quickly enough at the rate of growth of traffic. So the concept of using data centre-like technology and virtualising, in other words, taking what the software that used to run in the box and running it into a network data centre is at the foundation of the way we're evolving a network. Right. And indeed, all of the 5G functions that are coming along will run in effectively a network data centre. So there's a okay. massive transition we're going through, not only going to 5G, but we're rebuilding a network and an architecture we call uh, Network 2020. Okay. I'm going to come back to that in a minute because I'd like to touch into what Network 2020 means. We're actually surrounded by a couple of screens here which we won't get distracted by, but there's a network function virtualization operation tool over there, there's the monitoring tools, there's some yep. flashy new boxes here with LEDs. I guess you know when you were talking about that, what I was hearing is that you know you, you, you sort of grow from the core of the network where you've got the heavy lifting component of the, the bulk of the traffic from the edge of the network to the end, and then you start to grow on out. And you've got multiple layers, I guess, in that you've got to continue to supply the old legacy infrastructure from radio around the country through to you know four G, and then the shift to five G. And I guess the big challenge for you, as you said, is how do you then get that rapid emerging new capability that 5G is going to allow because there's, there's some applications and use cases in 5G we haven't even imagined yet I can Absolutely. sort of say it's not just phone calls and watching Netflix there was an interesting thing that came to mind when you were talking about that growth as well I mean uh, you probably remember that when Netflix as a brand was enabled legally in Australia without having to use a VPN I think the figure was and correct me if I'm wrong because it was your network but something like 40 or 50 percent uptake overnight when that application was enabled with international traffic and that was just one app so imagine when you've got lots and lots of different use cases I can't imagine what your challenge is like talk us through uh, so you, you've, you've collaborated with Ericsson, you part with them. Talk us through the, uh, I guess, the formation of that relationship and then the key steps of sort of going from building something in the lab and actually getting it out into the field. Yep. That would be great. Yes, absolutely. Now, one of the key things about any vendor relationship and any partnership that really works, and we do this with Ericsson and we do it with other partners as well, is you actually have to understand each other. Yes. So if a technology company knows our challenges and deeply, it means they bring good technology to us. And that's the heart and the foundation of how we've evolved. And, and if I go back to the 3G example, we broke a whole lot of technology barriers together. We laid out the problem, we jointly yep. figured out the solution, and we've done that. And it's that long-term relationship of understanding each other and working through the tough times together right. that builds yep. those types of relationships. And it's, it's how we get this technology to roll out quickly because we can take it from the Ericsson's lab in concept to very quickly uh, fast test it in elements in the network mm -hmm. and very quickly roll it out. We did it last year. Okay. We rolled out three million square kilometers of category M1, wow. which is the Internet of Things yeah. standard, in three to four weeks across the entire social network. By wow. the way we rapidly... We spent a whole day talking about just that. Absolutely, <laughs> and since then we've rolled out narrowband IoT. So our yep. ability to quickly get these features into the network is the heart of why you need these deep relationships so you can yeah. evolve them yeah. very, very quickly. And I think Telstra's been challenged in that you're effectively the incumbent carrier of the nation for many ways, and that Telstra's had to uh, bring out new and emerging technologies that everyone's demanding and screaming for in the Kardashian sort of celebrity experience at the front of the, the mobile, but also in the enterprise and government space as well. Everybody wants a piece of you and they want it now and, and, and forever. Um, I'd love to know a bit more about what you're doing with the virtualization of your network. So you talked about how that was going to roll out from new and emerging capabilities in 5G. Um, walk us through the transition from physically plugging things in and routers and switching the service to then, I guess, instantiating you know, virtual environments, whether you know, containerized Docker environments under Kubernetes and OpenStack on the Ericsson platform. That, that must be a massive cultural behavioral shift in engineering and design, but also just the enablement. And uh, I was talking with uh, Matt Carlson, who's uh, the head of R&D portfolio for Eric Erickson that day. And he said with the rollout of that platform uh, uh, with their OSS and BSS, things that would take eight months now take eight minutes and could even take eight milliseconds one day. Um, what's that shifting like from the engineering design point and then also just implementation to virtualize your network as Telstra? Well, you captured a lot of the challenges in, in a, a couple of minutes there. <laughs> uh, and the reality is it is a, an evolution. That's why it's a, a, a multi-year program. Yeah. But what we've decided to do is not wait. Okay. So if we sit and wait until everything's perfect and ready yeah. and solved, uh, we won't get started. So what we're doing is a massive transformation. We're actually building out a lot of the infrastructure. We are SDN enabling a lot of the underlying optical right. layer. Right. We're installing the data centers and then we're putting in where we need the technology now. So you, you raised some very uh, important questions because ultimately you need to be able to orchestrate everything from the bottom bit of the network, the optical, yeah all the way through the routing up until the individual service functions and then to a product and a service that you can mm -hmm. expose to a customer. Uh, that is a, a big evolution for the industry that we're going through Absolutely. as we speak. But again, we don't have to wait for it all to be solved. So the classic right. examples for us are our media products are growing incredibly quickly. Virtualization 
uh, in a in a cloud-based architecture is a perfect platform to go with hard early, and that's exactly what we've done. So okay. some of our media functions are already uh, virtualized and, and expanding and growing that way. The other rapid shift is the move from. 30 years of voice calling was done on circuit calls. Yep. Uh, now we're moving to uh, IP-based voice calling, which is called Volte, voice over yep. LTE. Yep. Uh, we're seeing such a rapid move. We are almost at 50% of all of our traffic, and that's in the last 12 to 18 months. 50% in 12 to 18 months. Has moved to... Wow, that's a tsunami of change. And if you can imagine the scaling of the platforms that that traffic is moving to in the traditional way. Yeah. So our foundation of our, our capability is built in the old technology. Right. But we've now virtualized, so all the growth is going to go into a virtual environment, so it can flex and expand wow. quicker as the rest of that migration occurs. And now as we think of 5G evolution, all of the functions in 5G are going to be virtual. So we're wow. preparing our 5G foundation, we're building that capability that will come in yeah. to that environment. Yeah. And not everything end to end will be orchestrated everywhere, but yeah. enough of that, uh, call it a domain, yeah. will yeah. start to be managed that way. And progressively the domains will be linked, okay. and we'll, we're basically decomposing the network into network as a service functions. So products and solutions can actually call on those functions and be stitched together over time. I like so that. So that's the end game. Yeah, yeah. But you know, you've got to have the vision and start building towards it. And there's an evolutionary scale, isn't it? Because and I think in many ways you almost become your first customer in your own right. And that is that as you build capability and network component of the business, other parts of your media or entertainment or yep. comms or voice or broadband, whatever, they're going to actually have that product become an uptake that they can then offer value to, isn't it? Precisely. And then yeah. we can expose network functions and customise functions right. for different customers where traditionally it would have taken years and a specification we can use you know, rapid uh, rollout of uh, software capabilities uh, to build services and products mm -hmm. over time for our customers. Work on it ourselves, get it right, then start to expose it. Very exciting. Well, Mike, thanks so much for so many insights. One last one, if I was going to get you to look into a crystal ball, given yeah. what you've seen around here on the Ericsson Pavilion, yeah. there's some amazing stuff happening in IoT, yeah. uh, the distributed cloud, the uh, network infrastructure layer that you're talking about. Um, are there any key standard areas that you've personally seen uh, just in your role within Telstra and, and running the, the network part of the business? Is there anything that you've sort of seen here that you think uh, has, has been a, more than you expected? I guess you know you come here with a, an expectation that things going to wow you. Is yeah. there something that just really leapt out at you? Thought I didn't expect Ericsson to be that far down the, the evolutionary path with it. Well, I, I always expect things to change quickly, but I think the two things that have grown incredibly quickly in the last 12 months is firstly the rate at which the Internet of Things capabilities has become right, real. Right. So we now have the platform, the chips, and if you like, the platforms to do the analytics and start to stitch together services and solutions. Right. This is the beginning of the new industrial re revolution. This is the okay. ability to I take like that. every factory, every business, well, small, be, medium, and large, on a standardized, if you like, platform to help them automate, right, to right. improve their productivity, uh, to improve agriculture. And we're seeing some great exactly. agricultural examples here Right yes. now, in a yes. country the size of Australia, with, with the distances we travel, the cost of labour, perfect fit. Australia is absolutely set up to take advantage of these emerging technologies. That's foundational, if you like. When we start 5G, it will start probably as more of an extension of 4G. In other words, more of what we all yeah. do, yeah. faster, you know, quicker reaction times. Yeah. But the real excitement comes when we take 5G, the ability to put massive compute right out near the, the edge of the premises, where the, the edge, data is, yeah. where the data is, and process it. Massive bandwidths um, with 5G. Yeah, yeah. You can imagine what you could do with mining and industry oh. in that world. And you know, I really think we'll see an initial phase. Why we and our customers need to understand how you use this technology, yeah, yeah. how you standardise it, because the trick is in standardisation for mass consumption, and then we'll see a massive growth in automation and productivity improvement if we get this right. Wow, well what a take out. Well I, I really do like that take out that you've seen effectively the start of the, the, the next industrial revolution in the digital form, that's a fantastic take out, I'm going to get that on a t-shirt. Mike, thanks so much for your time, it's been great to talk to you, great to see an Aussie at the show. Um, I love all your insights what's happening here and I love hearing what's going on in Telstra. Uh, I have ho great hopes of what's uh, going to be in uh, my children's generations of technology going forward. Um, and I'm very excited to uh, see what you're doing with Ericsson and uh, look forward to what's happening in the next 12 to 18 months coming out of your business unit. Thanks very much, Mike. Thanks a lot. Folks, you've got some great insights of what's happening with Telstra and the relationship with Ericsson. You've had some amazing insights of what Mike's taken out of this event here, particularly, uh, and I love that takeaway, that this is the beginning of the, the, the fourth generation uh, of the Industrial Revolution. This is Des Blanchfield here at uh, Mobile World Congress 2018. We'll see you in the next video. Thanks for tuning in.